is you never get it right. It's an ongoing, moving target, right? And there's a lot of learning experimentation that happens like, almost every day when you talk to your customers. So I wanted to keep this as interactive as possible. Let me start with just a little bit about my background, and then I wanted to go around the table and ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, but the reason I'm passionate about pricing is that I actually run a pricing company. That's what we do. Uh, we sell software that banks use to price the things they sell to you. So loans, mortgages, investments, money market accounts, CDs, et cetera, and so forth. Right? And so obviously that is a kind of a two-part question. One is how do you think about pricing banking products to consumers or to small businesses? And that has a whole body of science and data and analytics behind it, which is what we sell. And then we always have the, the problem that you're all facing, which is at the core, we're an enterprise B2B SaaS company, and we price our own solutions, right? And so you would think that as a pricing company, we're good at pricing, and we try to hold ourselves to that standard of, hey, we should be good at this, so let's think about it. And we do a lot of work internally. Um, so as a company, we're about uh, 30 million in, in uh, ARR. This year, uh, work with you know the world's largest banks, do very large deals. So most of my experience will be out of the realm of you know, for a hundred thousand dollar per year deal and up, <coughs> custom pricing, heavily negotiated, with all the implications that, that that brings, you know, for you and your sales team and your commission and how you structure and think about deals. Um, but obviously, we can we can go uh, to the lower end or, or smaller, you know, uh, ticket size pricing as well and, and look for that. So um, I wanted to start with kind of a, just going around the table and ask you all to introduce yourself. So just you know, your name, name of your company. Uh, what you sell, how much you think you're charging if you've gotten that far, um, and then I want you to think about could you charge 10% more? And let's see, Andrew, lucky draw, why don't you start? Uh, okay, so I haven't really launched yet, but I was thinking of charging um, 10%. Um, could I charge 10% more? Oh, what, sorry, what, sorry, what are you, what are you yeah, selling? Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> right. uh, so, uh, basically, it's, it's a PVP model. Um, it's basically uh, everyday home, uh, home cooks selling directly to uh, consumers. Okay. Uh, so I'll, I'll be thinking of 10%. 10% commission. Commission, yeah, I'll be sale. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not entirely sure if I can do 10% more. I think it's time to. Sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, so we, we sell uh, software to make sales people's lives easier. Um, we charge fifty dollars per user per month. Um, I'm sure we could charge. If we can get fifty, we can get fifty-five. Our question is like, we haven't sold it yet. <laughs> so oh, you haven't sold. It. <laughs> so you don't know whether you can get fifty. Don't know if we can get fifty. Although I like when people are into it, they really like it. We, I was just saying we just got our first verbal, and like he didn't balk at the price, but that's the only data point that we had. Yeah. Well, um, Patrick, uh, we sell disposable medical diagnostic tests. Uh, we charge anywhere from a dollar to seven dollars for these, and we could probably charge them for someone. To consumers? Or to uh, doctors? Or we sell them to pharmacies who sell them on to consumers. Yeah. Arvin, Fusion Memory. Um, we make high performance compute more efficient and cheaper, and our unit price averages around 70 to 80, um, 75k. Um, I we I don't think we can charge more because we're already bumping towards the customer sensitivity. So we are we are a, a unit is what? Uh, a unit is uh, what we can attach to a server that they have. So per server, is that fair? Yeah, so that, uh, it includes software, uh, hardware cost, software support, probably combined. Yeah, got it. And seventy-five k per year. Uh, this is a hard sell, so it's per unit. It's hardware. The software component is recurring. Yeah, but uh, so that would be around uh, one. Twenty-five percent of it is software that is recurring, um, but the seventy-five percent of it is one, one time. Got it. Okay. Hi, my name is Ray. Uh, we sell private like workspaces on demand, and we currently charge somewhere between fifty to eighty-five dollars an hour to use. 
and we could probably charge 10% more, depending on the consumer that's coming for that week, for that day. And you sell it by the hour, by the day, by the week? Oh yeah, right now, drop me by the hour. Got it, okay. Hi, my name is Patrick, I'm from Replace. We do um, a B2B software that does IT infrastructure insights and optimization. So we're probably closer to kind of the deal sizes you were mentioning. Um, and we don't have a predefined pricing strategy, otherwise, other than, so my background is in, in enterprise sales, so um, the pricing is very opportunistic most of the time. It also depends on the type of customer that we speak to, um, also the type of uh, discounts they, expect, they have come to expect from their vendors, uh, how the purchasing kind of strategies usually work. So it depends usually, but we're looking at average deal size, anywhere between kind of 60 to 120 uh, a year. Thousand, isn't it? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Selling to IT. Um, no. So there's usually about four stakeholders involved, and ideal scenario, it starts with C level, CFO or CTO usually. Um, if not, then it's um, C minus one, C minus two, like an SVP kind of situation. Cool. I'm from the same company as Ray Burn. Um, from Burness, we sell workspaces and media rooms. Right now, we're charging fifty dollars an hour. Um, we could charge a lot more if we're targeting conference goers, trying to close deals during conferences, and probably uh, sell a lot less if we're charging uh, freelancers and entrepreneurs. We need um, an instant from the Yep. <clears throat> so we sell. So I'm Avery. I'm from Shell. We sell space flights, commercial space flights. Average ticket price is about two hundred fifty thousand. Um, can we charge ten percent more? Probably not, but we could. There's a way we could make ten percent more margin by buying the flights in bulk and raise, raising capital to do a hotel tonight model. So. And you're selling that to individual consumers, to consumers as well as potentially the government. Okay, uh, but we're buying them from enterprise of B2B. You buying the seats, or you're not running your own shuttle? No, we're not, we're not yet running our own hardware, okay. but if we raise enough money, we can do that. <laughs> okay. So this is high-end space travel for, for the super for individuals and possibly for research projects. Okay, for RV and, and okay. yeah, but, yeah. Okay. Uh, we're Tag Bio. Um, we sell a license to our data science platform, um, and our pricing is all over the map. Right now, we've got two customers at UCSF Net Center and Novartis. And at UCSF, we're charging them 10 grand a month. At Novartis, we're charging uh, about three grand a month. But it's fundamentally different approaches. And at UCSF has a big centralized data set, lots of users. Novartis is individual researchers, smaller data sets, more instances. Yeah. How did you come up with those numbers? Uh, at Novartis, it was what that guy could you know, an individual researcher could pay for out of his discretionary funds every month. And at UCSF, it was, we pushed until they said, okay, we can't do that, but we can do this. And we were told by a, a VC that we spoke to earlier that we were criminally undercharging UCSF, but <laughs> we are getting money out of this. Yeah. Go ahead. Same company. company. What's your name? Sorry. Mark. Mark. Oh, it's Mark. Yeah. Tom Mark. Yeah. Tom. Yep. So I didn't get a chance because I get kind of past oh, sorry. what I'd like to say. Um, so uh, we have kind of strange pricing. So uh, we're, uh, uh, my name is Mark, I'm from Cogitai, and uh, our product is a, is a continual learning um, cloud service. It doesn't exist yet. Uh, we're doing sort of phase one um, consulting projects where, we, uh, where we're charging basically by the hour. And, uh, but we're moving to phase two which is going to be um, use of the service for decision making. And every industry is going to have very, very different um, needs because it's multi-sector. And um, so we have no idea what to charge, but we're thinking it's going to be sort of a revenue sharing kind of thing or um, um, cost um, sharing. And what kind of decisions? Um, decision making. It's decision making in the cloud. Decision, yeah, it's a learning system. So it learns to make better and better decisions over time. Thank you. I'm um, from Stories. And, well, the software itself automates um, data analysis. 
but what we're selling is um, higher um, business performance and uh, faster insights, so faster time to run this. And we're charging currently, so we have five live customers and we're, we're they're paying anywhere between one thousand and sixteen thousand dollars per month. We could definitely charge three times more uh, yeah. with the right with the right messaging and uh, positioning. Could you charge ten percent more without doing anything? Mm. Yes. Yes. Well, I'm, uh, my name's Sahil. Um, I'm with Nick and Ray. They pretty much yep. covered everything. Cool. Um, Keith, from, oh, sorry. Yeah, you <laughs> <laughs> I'm Keith from Operant. Uh, so we connect industrial uh, IoT devices to the internet. And uh, we were going to charge, we have hardware, so we were going to charge for our thing, like one time, and then everyone here at Opera is a, a horrible idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the worst idea ever. So, but that's what people in our industry are used to, so we're changing over. And uh, I think we could easily, if we amortize that over time, we could easily charge 10% more. I think it would be actually very attractive for our customers. Do you have customers yet? Uh, we have pilot customers. No. Yeah. But we know the price. It, it should be around 200 250 bucks per device. Per year? Or no, that but that's like the one-time thing, and that's what they're used to. Okay. And then we'll change that to maybe however much per month. But these are large deployments. We would buy thousands of them. What type of devices? It's like a gate communication gate. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, I'm Amy. Uh, we're, we're building AI assisted teletherapy for teledevelopment. And I'm currently in a B2C model and switching to B2B. So I don't know if we pricing yet, but for B2C, we're currently charging individual families um, for Thousand USD a year. Insurance covered or private? Out of pocket. Private. Out of pocket. <coughs> Do you think you can charge more? Oh, we'll see. Um, yes. Hi. Hello. Uh, yeah, just yeah, just from Bonek. So we're uh, what we're selling is an app that records and transcribes mobile phone calls for enterprise field sales. And so right now, uh, we, we're starting out with super as much as we would like to go with the big deals, but we don't have the security and scalability. So these reps will be paying out their own pocket. So we're thinking anywhere from 25 to 50 bucks a month, depending on usage from our beta tests. But uh, in order that I'm not exactly sure how, exactly how much, because they are paying out their own pocket. And it depends on the value that you're going to get. Them. And they would do this because you're transcribing and putting the content into Salesforce, or? Yeah. So, 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 so it's kind of workflow or efficiency for the salesperson. Exactly. So we want it to be more data capture for the joints. Yeah. Your analysis afterwards and the effectiveness. Interesting. Um, and do you have customers yet? No. We're, we're, so we're launching. Well, we're getting a, 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 a version that we can beta test in by the end of the week. Oh, yeah. Cool. All right. Uh, do, we, do we miss anyone? No. All right. Well, thank you guys. So part of the exercise here, this is actually one of the kind of ten lessons that I wanted to talk to about, was, you know, when you ask people, could you charge ten percent more? The answer usually is, of course we could. The logical question that you should then ask is, why don't you? Right? Because that ten percent more that you charge is pure profit. Right? And gives you another month of runway, allows you to hire someone else, right? All is being equal, it's just your profit uh, to the bottom line. Right? So why don't you do that? The other question um, that usually comes up as well, you know, we're early stage, I'm trying to grow the business, I can't be out of market in pricing. So let me ask the opposite question. Do you think you would sell more if you lowered your pricing by 10%? No. Exactly. So there's this really weird uh, conceptual bias around pricing, right? Which is the price elasticity, by and large, for almost everything we sell or buy, is fairly symmetrical. However, it's never perceived that way. Like you kind of think about it as, yeah, I could get more, but I'm not going to because I'm worried about losing a deal, right? 
yet it's a lot easier to, to, to lower price. And so that's one of the kind of core lessons, I think, if you look at um, B2B pricing in particular, you think about where most people start is you start too low. Right? There's always money to be left, or there's, there's money left on the table by and large. And I think that's pretty consistent with you know, the prior classes that have come through here and the experience that you will hear and or experience when you actually start pricing and start selling deals. All right, so, so really 10 lessons I wanted to go through today. Um, I'm gonna write them quickly and then we can dive into each one and, and have a conversation around it. The first one is really this notion of you know, really understanding what you call. Because right? pricing is not a goal in itself. It should enable your business strategy. So being clear about your business strategy and where you want to be is important. Can you guys read that? Okay. Uh, second point, I think everyone probably gets this by now, cost plus pricing is dead. This whole notion of you know, I'm adding up my cost and I'm slapping on a margin and I go to market that way. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, I'll talk a little bit about understanding the reason customers buy. So this why, 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 and really deconstructing the value because ultimately that's what allows you to drive price. Um, some learnings around kind of price design and how to keep it simple and how to you know, communicate pricing. Uh, I think we're, we're supposed to talk a little bit about pilots and pros and cons and some learnings there. Um, the difference between price setting and price getting. So the whole notion of how you set your price and then how you communicate and how you get it, how you negotiate, very different, especially as you get you know, into larger enterprise sales. Um, pricing and sales compensation, how do you design comp plans to the extent that you actually hire salespeople and not doing the, the selling yourself, which I think most everyone is probably still in that phase. Um, some interesting um, things to think about, about you know, the, the irrational side of pricing, um, the one we just covered, you know, the 10% question. Um, you can probably charge more and then a little bit about price testing. So let's dive in. Um, I think the, the, the biggest mistake people probably make is um, not thinking about their pricing in the context of what the goal is that you have as an enterprise, right? And especially at early stage, we think about where you are today. By and large, most of you probably don't have, you know, bottom line profit, EBITDA, net income, uh, or margin as a goal, right? That comes later. Early on, your goal is, you know, initial market traction, getting a couple of customers, getting logos, right? Getting as much you know, early ramp on recurring revenue so that you can go back to investors and showcase the app, right? Um, to get the next funding, the next funding round done, right? Um, so as you think about your goal, right, in terms of how you set pricing, it's it's really important to start with that as as the you know the going in question that you're very very clear on, and pricing can then be designed around that. So for example, if you know if you're very early. Uh, and you're doing pilots, what's the most important thing around a successful pilot? Whether it's converting, yeah. But you know, if you have UCSF and you have Novartis, what's so, worth gold? So we, we, we create champions of both of those places for the pilot. And yeah, exactly. working with the pilot we Case study, press release, yeah. reference customer, yeah. get them up at a, you know, at a lunch and learn for the next five customers. That's huge value, right? So think about, if that's really what I want to do with my first customer, maybe the first one is about, does the thing actually work? Like, kind of technical proof. But presume that you all building companies that will eventually work, you will get past that. And then the most valuable thing is, can I get a reference customer? Can I get someone to you know, help me sell the next one? Will that person take a call? And you can actually build that into your pricing. Right? We've done things where we said, if, if you, you know, early on, you're doing a pilot, if you are committed to taking 10 reference calls in the next 12 months, from banks, in our case, uh, we will knock fifty thousand dollars off the price, okay. right? and people will sign up for that, right? Because ultimately, it's someone's budget, and they're looking at it going fifty k, ten phone calls. Sounds like a good deal to me, right? And you have someone committed to actually doing reference calls. And by and large, they will never say anything negative anyway. Right? So that's you know one way to think about pricing is what are you actually trying to get? If it's a logo, if it's a reference uh, customer, if it's someone to stand up and say, I used your product service, right? That's incredible. Um, another interesting one is this question of you're, you're really selling to two audiences right now, right? You're selling to your customers and you're selling to the investor community. And investors are pretty simple in that they look for companies that have a big market. So how do you think about pricing in a way where early on you create a very large 
town to a little addressable market, right? Um, and obviously, if you underprice, it's very hard to convince people that you can go from ten dollars a month, twenty dollars a month, to five hundred dollars a month. So you might be better off having a couple of customers at five hundred bucks a month than twice the number of customers at ten bucks a month, because it creates that reference point. Right, for investors in particular to say, this company's onto something, there's a significant market here. Because right? it's easier to think about total number of customers times some large number than total number of customers times a number that I then need to increase by two, three hundred percent. There's this general point of, you know, if you, if you think about the end goal um, as being either growth or logos or you know, cash, et cetera, one of the core pieces, and we'll talk a lot about this, is understanding price elasticity. Okay. Where's the where's the walk away point of the customer? How far can I get to that? And ideally, you know, you should leave a dollar on the table, not more. Right. And so, you know, a big part of the work is going to be understanding uh, the price sensitivity, the elasticity of the customer. Does that make sense? So one of the things that, that um, if you have data, right, this is actually coming out of our software. If you have data and you do lots of transactions, you can actually chart this, right? This is price, rate differential is a banking thing, um, and then take up probability or close rate, right? And one of the key things to understand, and you only need really 20, 30 transactions before you can start charting this, is where are you, right? If you're somewhere here, you can charge a lot more before you see a meaningful drop off, right? If you're somewhere here, very price sensitive, okay, so start thinking about, you know, if I charge less, maybe I could get more. If I charge more, there's a drop off. And if you're over here, you know, you clearly priced yourself out of the market. But, but it's very uh, common that people overestimate the price sensitivity in the market, right? Meaning they think they're somewhere in the middle, but you're really still on that upper curve up there. Does that make sense? So how do you you said you can build this out of 20 data points. Um, how? Uh, <laughs> excuse me. How do I basically calculate the probability of a certain price point when um, my customers differ? And you know, I, I sort of I ask one customer. Are you okay with this price? Um, yes, no. And maybe I get a chance to test another level, right? Maybe I don't because sure. it's, it's just there. So, so I'm just trying to... Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, hold it for a second because it's ultimately about talking to customers. And maybe the more important thing is talking to the customers you lose, right? The, the lost quotes, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There is tremendous value in that, but you need to dig in and need to understand it. This notion of asking a customer uh, how much are you willing to pay, very, very hard, right? It rarely works. I mean, anyone in their right mind wouldn't tell you the truth, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> right. Um, so, uh, so you really need to look at the deals you're winning and the deals you're losing and try and identify where is the, where is the breaking point and is the breaking point actually price, right? Or is it some other thing, right? Lack of product market so we'll we'll get into that actually in the next topic. Um, sorry, question. Um, in the previous chart, by uh, saying even though we think we are probably in the middle of it, it's likely we are in early uh, ahead, right? Not higher on the curve. What contributes to that, in your view? I mean, knowingly, you know, none of us would price low, right? If we felt like there was more, but it seems like there is still something at play there, right? In yeah. Your, in your opinion, what is that? I think there's the, there's the general notion of um, you are willing, you are trying to win as many deals as possible, right? Um, in, at this stage, and I remember when we were at this stage, you don't really know how much to charge, and you're kissing a lot of frogs. You're talking to a lot of folks. Um, you're presenting pricing, and a lot of times people will tell you, uh, "I can't work with you. I don't have the budget," right? Or that's too expensive, or that doesn't make sense. Often, that's not actually the real reason, right? And once you have true product market fit, you can charge more than you think you can charge today, right? You haven't found product market fit, therefore you're thinking it's price, right? And I've had so many companies coming through here and elsewhere where, you know, 
we've had a tough time. We've had we did you know 30 demos and we only got four people were interested and only one converted to a lower price. Hey, no, think about it. You have 30 demos, you have four people who are interested. It's not a price problem, right? It's a product market fit problem. But it's easy to say it's price. Therefore, I'm going to lower it, right? Or I'm trying to lower it. Right? And it's I mean just it's it's human yeah. nature to, to say it's not me, it's not my product. Oh, it must be price, right? If I just charge less, I'll be more successful. I, do I have scientific proof of that? No. <laughs> I, 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 I don't think I've ever talked to anyone who said, uh, you know, we, we should have charged less early on. So, in some sense, what you're saying is uh, misrepresentation of data. I mean, the data, if that is related to lack of market fit, but we are looking at as price sensitivity. That's the issue. It's easy to misinterpret it that way. Sure. Okay. So, is that a question? Yeah. <clears throat> How often does the market in your competition dictate that price? And when you say, okay, here's the market price, and I want to lower that to increase my number of shares, market share, and all that, which is your general problem. Yeah, I mean, often, right? It depends on what you're selling. Are you selling a, a truly innovative, completely new solution that doesn't have a reference point, doesn't have competitors? Right, great. Then, you know, more power to you, and you can, you can charge more, and you can establish a market price. If you're in a crowded space, Right then, you have this this kind of you're in this area in the middle, right, where it's highly competitive, and if you're selling an undifferentiated commodity, then the good news is that if you can lower the cost base, you can compete on price, capture a lot of market. Right? Generally, that's probably not what anyone in this room try, is trying to do. I don't know if you are, but you know, that's that's a very tough way to compete. So, if you do use the the market and competitors, right, I think it's a good way to set reference points. And then figure out how, not through price, you differentiate. Right? And you say, this is how we're different. This is why we can potentially charge more, right? Or we have a different price point that, that commands a premium. But I mean, it, it, it depends on what you're selling, right? And it depends on whether there is a reference price, whether there's a standard way of buying, right? A standard rate sheet that people are looking at a price sheet. Right? In some industries, you know, hardware semiconductor, that's the case. So when you're negotiating a price, does it? In some ways, so we don't charge by seat, we charge any number of people can access the data instance because that encourages adoption and it's a great thing. But we can, in theory, dial something up and dial something down in a negotiation where we say, oh, it's that too expensive for you, then we'll take, we'll take, you can just have this many seats or something. Do you recommend that or how do you, in response to pricing, do you change your offering? Um, yes, we've done that. I think that the, the general, the hard question is, What's truly the value driver, right? For a SaaS company, the question is, you know, software used to be sold uh, per shrink wrap or per seed, right? Um, but now you have a whole host of models that you can pursue. Um, and, and because you can meter the software, you can, you can come up with any sort of pricing mechanism. Um, the, I think the general advice I have is, is understanding what the core value metric is. Right? So back to, if you look at, at this here, um, no. Seats users don't really drive value. What drives value is, are you, you know, are you selling more homes uh, if you're if you're doing something in real estate, right? Are you scheduling more customers if you're in some sort of scheduling software? Are you, you know, decreasing costs if you're doing something on IoT or, you know? Um, and so, remind me again, your business was Tech oh the, the data the platform for Novartis and, and yes, UCSF. Our, our, our dial from time and replacement of, or enablement of data scientists to work faster and more efficiently. Yeah. So how do you measure that? How do you measure the value? Um, well, right now we know it takes, it used to take six weeks for them to get an answer from the data science team and now it takes seven. And but increase, increase speed to insight basically and then also yeah. the idea of, um, Okay, so we can look, so this, this, do you sell yourself as a piece of software or do you sell yourself as the value that, that software brings to the customer? Because, you know, we can look at, we can look at UCSF's medical information and tell you that Albumin, you know, I'm going to make this up, this isn't true, so it's not proprietary. Albumin is, they're losing six, six million dollars a year on Albumin. Yeah. Do we have six million dollars of value to them? I don't know, but we just told them that result and they wouldn't necessarily have seen it without the software. Basic advice, listen to your customers um, and listen to your prospects, right? And I think the hard part is the pricing conversations are uncomfortable. Right? Oftentimes customers will tell you it was price because they don't want to tell you that they didn't like your solution or it wasn't a good fit. Right? 
it's easy to blame price. It, it's easy to say, I don't have the budget. Right? I really like what you do, Avery, but I just don't have the budget this year. Right? Not a hard conversation. Versus, I, I really don't understand what your software does, or I really don't need it, etc. Right? That's a, not a conversation that a, a buyer even wants to have. I think the hard part is really digging into that and trying to understand how much of the underlying reason that you're not winning a deal or that you're winning a deal is price, right? And try to isolate back to that question of how do I isolate price sensitivity or, or, or the, the price response behavior. Um, there, there's this kind of drill down, right, into ultimately um, probably three different dimensions that drive um, the, the value in a particular sale. And I guess you guys are doing you're doing um, sales strategy and you know, framing, presentment, et cetera. If you haven't done it already, um, as one of the, the, uh, the sessions in this, in this class. Um, but from a pricing perspective, the things that I've found is that there are really three, three drivers for the sale and three drivers of price elasticity. One is the technical need. Right? The very simple, I need an um, analytics platform for my researchers. Right, and uh, they need the ability to aggregate data and drive insights and you know run algorithms on top of that data. So there's a technical need. Um, no one really buys for very few people buy for technical need. Second reason is the business need. Why do I actually need that platform? What's the business value that I'm generating? Well, if I can save money for UCSF or for my organization, that's good. If I can drive revenue, right, that's good. But that's still not the reason why people do things, right? Ultimately, it boils down to what's the personal reason, right? So somewhere, someone is making a decision to go with you guys versus not doing anything or going with a competitor. What's in it for that person, right? At the visceral, personal level. Is that, you know, personal goal? Is that on the way to a promotion? Is that risk avoidance, right? Don't want to look stupid? Uh, you just said, Jahan, who is the champion, hates decision support. <laughs> so, deeply. Yeah. And, we'll, and we, we allow him to not try to talk to him. And fundamentally, that's why he's super happy. Yeah. <laughs> so true. if it's, you it's find someone like that, right, who has who is not an even keel, right, who has a visceral belief in something, okay, he's, a, he's a super man. He's a really lovely person, but he just it's really, he goes on cliff and he talks about. It. Yeah. Yeah. So there's a fun little video out there. It might be a little bit. Um, I think this guy's kind of fallen out of favor for inappropriate behavior. Hey, I um, never, 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 never judge other. But people. have you ever seen the never do. the why? But I never do. And this radical like, you construction. Know you, you can't answer a kid's question. They don't accept any answer. A kid never goes, "Oh, thanks, I get it." They fucking never say that. They just keep coming. More questions. Why? 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 So you don't even know who the fuck you are anymore at the end of the conversation. It's the same them. deconstruction. It's amazing. This is my daughter the other day. She's like, Papa, why can't we go outside? Well, because it's raining. Why? Well, water's coming out of the sky. Why? Because it was in a cloud. Why? Well, clouds form when there's vapor. Why? I don't know. I don't know, that's, I don't know any more things. Those are all the things I know. <laughs> Why? Because I'm stupid. Okay? <laughs> it keeps going, you get the point, right? There's always a something behind the, the reason, right? And so part of this exercise around truly understanding willingness to pay prices it was back. Drill down to that. Right? Keep asking that question. I don't have any budget. Why don't you have any budget? Well, budgets were decided last year. Okay, so let's talk about how you get budget for next year, right? Or where did that budget come from? Who makes the decision? Why, 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 why? Right? So it's uh, this radical deconstruction um, and the notion of drilling in a technical, personal, uh, uh, technical business and personal need. Um, One of the things that, that uh, companies often get wrong is you think about pricing too much, you try to come up with a really, really sophisticated model, and you end up confusing the customer. So one of the key learnings we've had is as much as you can put sophistication into your underlying pricing logic, your model, you know, how you build up price, 
to the customer, it should be super simple. It should be easy to understand. And so back office complexity, okay, front office, right, either to the customer or to your sales team should be relatively simple and easy to understand. Especially if there are already reference points in the market, right? So if the entire if you're in a market where everyone buys on a per seat basis or on a you know per hour basis or on a per you know whatever the ticker value is, right? Radically um, uh, departing from that without a logical reason just confuses and creates incremental obstacles. So keeping it simple and keeping it easy to understand to the customer is I think a critical takeaway, right? Because Thinking about price is generally not a good thing right, for the customer. Right? The, the likely outcome of I can't afford it or it's expensive right, is high. So you want to make the consumption of whatever your pricing strategy is as easy as possible. Does that make sense? Um, there are some interesting scenarios where you're actually you're selling something that is very, very hard to evaluate. In which case, price can actually be a signal of value. Right. Um, the classic example is diamonds. If anyone has bought diamonds, you don't really know a whole lot. They all look shiny and good, but there's a big difference between the five thousand and the fifty thousand dollar diamond. Right? And De Beers has come up with, you know, this. They did this in the fifties, I think, of two months salary. Right? It was the minute. Um, all right. Um, pilots and pricing. So, I think you're. Is is anyone not doing pilots right now? Start. Yeah, I'm sorry, but, but everyone wants to do pilots. Um, so why would you do pilots? I think from, from our perspective, they actually offer us a window into the data and the customer. So even if it's unsuccessful, we get to see what the data was, we get to see the questions they were asking the data, and then we learn more about that model and how that works. And in fact, the company itself really runs on how do you break questions. Yeah. So I think there, there is a good reason to do pilots, which is technical proof, right? And by and large, it needs to be technical proof to yourself, not to the customer, right? Because customers generally don't like being guinea pigs. Um, so there's this, you know, kind of challenge you have early on where you, you think you have a good product, you don't know for certain because no one has truly implemented and used it, right, in, in enterprise sales. So you want to get someone to be on board and actually validate that and validate the technical fit and the fact that the product actually works. That's a good reason to do a pilot. Now, generally not a good thing to tell the customer that. Right? Um, I don't really know if it's going to work, but I would like you to try it. Right? And by the way, I want to charge you for it too. Um, so I'm not saying don't do pilots. What I'm saying is think about how you communicate pilots and think about how you price pilots in general. Are you, are you assuming that all pilots are priced, are charged for? Um, yes. Okay. And it's just, case, but... there's a strong reason for that, and this is this is coming out of hard experience. Mm. I found that the more you charge for a pilot, the more likely it is to succeed. Is that because you filter out all the people at the beginning, or because it's actually yeah, okay? Yes, it's a it's a it's a uh, it's a sampling and and uh, filtering challenge, right? Okay. There is this dynamic that if someone in an enterprise, an organization, right, it, it, this is about B2B, this is not about B2C, but about B2B, someone who signs up for a $50,000 investment has an incentive to make sure you get the data, make sure you get the support, make sure you get the access to the IT folks, right? Um, do the steer codes that you need, give you the data back that you need to evaluate it, right? And somewhere along the way, that person's boss will say, hey, how about that 50K you spend on those guys with their data platform? Whatever happened to that? So right now, then, that person has an incentive to make sure it succeeds. Um, I call it the I give a shit. Right? Someone in the organization has spent enough money that they care, right? which is very different than saying, oh, free pilot? Yeah, well, it's the worst that can happen, right? We have the issue that IT is the immune system that rejects small companies because they are trifling and they will take over time. And if we go too high, it'll go up to them and they'll reject it. So, I think I got that. So, I the, there's a floor with, or yeah. a I had the exact opposite experience. We got denied by IT security on a free pilot. Okay. Really? Specifically because it was free. They that said, we don't, we don't uh, spend our time on anything that's worth less than $25,000. <laughs> that's uh, <funny>. And, <laughs> yeah, so we got shut you down. You just put on the mustache and came back with it. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, but no, I would say in general, it has been a big challenge with us with IT. Um, that was like an extreme case, but then also, um, you know, again, like when IT is kind of gives their default no, it's like, is the champion going to go back? Yeah. There's always a second round, and then the, like where we haven't talked about money, then like the champion was maybe not that into it to begin with, and they're not going to fight for us. I think, I mean, the, the experience we've had is we've done free pilots, and they somewhere get stuck along the way, right? Because you just don't have the focus on it, and you don't have someone's skin in the game, and that's an important one, right? So, uh, so that's the reason to charge for it. And you go back and say, okay, so, so if I have technical proof, I know the solution works, right? I'm, we know, I know, I've, I've deployed it three, four times, customers are using it, we know it works. And the customer says, well, I want to do it. Why, why would a customer want to do a pilot? They're not testing out the technical proof, because you have technical proof, right? And especially if you've done something where you have a reference customer in a case study and some other folks you can go back to. What they're really proving or trying to do is they're trying to limit the risk to themselves. Organizationally, again, someone sticks their neck out, spends some money, signs a contract, right? Doesn't work bad. Um, or there's something really unique about their business, right? Where the three or five customers you already have, they're different, they're smaller, they're bigger, there's something, and I want to know this myself, right? And so the, what we've done uh, to, to get around this notion of pilot is to reframe the conversation to say, we will sell you a license. You have to sign up for a year, you have to sign up for three years. And if you implement and it doesn't work, we will give you an opt-out. You can terminate at any point, right? And you're done, right? And we might even give you some money back. But you have to implement, you have to go live, right? Because we know, I know, that once customers go live, the software works. It works every single time, right? So I'm happy to give you that opt-out, right? And if it's truly about risk management in an organization, you can position a pilot as that, which is, you're, I'm not selling you a pilot, I'm selling you a full subscription because I know it works. If for whatever reason you need some risk avoidance mechanism, I'll give you an opt-out, right? Which, they will still call it a pilot, but you have a subscription that you can show to an investor and say, hey, someone signed up for three years, right? Or 12 months, or however, you know, a bigger piece of the pie than just the pilot. Does that make sense? Do investors care about opt-out clauses? They're in, in not, not, not unless they read the contract. I mean, the, the reality is that every contract has some opt-out, right? And it's, what you're saying is you get an opt-out if you implement Right, and you've been live for three months, and it didn't work, right? And you can almost call that a breach of contract clause, right? So, by and large, no one, no one has really done into that. And, and our experience has been, the big hurdle back to is getting the deal sold in the first place. No one exercises that opt-out, especially once it works. And especially if someone has put enough money down that you know they have some stake in the success. The very high end, there's this interesting dynamic, but very, very rarely do businesses or executives in the business admit that the $20 million implementation they just did didn't work. It doesn't happen, right? Because it's a, it's a career limiting move. It gets you fired. So there is that dynamic of, again, someone putting money behind it has to. All this being equal, I want to make it successful. Okay, um, so there's this whole distinction between price setting and price getting. So price setting is, you know, we're all sitting around with our spreadsheets and uh, grand visions of the future and trying to figure out how to price and do all the work around um, profitability and competitive positioning, et cetera. And then there's the reality of the customer, the conversation with the customer and the presentment. Um, and so a couple of key points here. One is understanding the buying process, which is usually or ideally driven by the person who ends up being, if not your user, at least the economic buyer of that user. At the person who cares about the value that your product generates. Um, unfortunately, eventually, there will be a procurement organization or an IT organization that gets involved. Right? And those guys have very clear incentives and goals around beating up vendors. Right? They might say things like, we don't do free pilots, or we don't do anything that's less than 25 k which is great, but right? keeps them um, focused. Um, they might have things, you know, there's, there's classic procurement um, goals around 30%, right? You want to knock off 30% from whoever walks in with whatever price, and they keep a scorecard, right? And Mr. Procurement Manager gets a promotion if he does that consistently or gets 35%. So just understanding the difference between 
the person who is, you know, your sponsor, your supporter, and enthusiastic who says, yes, I love your solution, I want to get it in, versus the guy or, or girl, the person you're then dealing with in procurement is in part of the price being a small number rather than the price being a big number. Yeah, actually, if I may, yeah, I had similar, one of the most enlightening experience, uh, conversations around buying, around the, around the buying process with one of the procurement people in uh, one of the big German companies. Oh, they're really fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, you know, I was really worried about sort of about the procurement process because there's a whole system for it and so on. But um, the people in procurement, uh, there, was, there was a lady, and she was really nice. She basically told me, uh, look, why, why did you... Because um, she was saying, now we're going to go through like a price negotiation. So, you know, here is the price you gave us, and uh, here is space for the price, you know, for, for the price you will give us now. <laughs> and <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, well, you know, we already gave the discount um, before, so it's going to be the same. And she says, well, why did you give the discount before? Uh, <laughs> the guys in the business, they don't care. Correct. Right? Yeah. You know, I, I get paid basically based on, on how much, how, on this difference between these two numbers. And she says, you know, so, and the minimum we have to go for is, is 5%, and um, if, you, if you subtract 10% there, then I'll get a promotion, right? So. It's as simple as that. Yeah, exactly. So she just told me, and she said, "Look, like this is a pilot, you know. So, so it's just so that you know that once we're going through this again uh, with the real numbers afterwards, <laughs> so that you know to, it really helps. That is unusual for Joe. It, it really helps. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's good for you if they're that transparent and that nice. It was nice to understand that you know that they are humans too, um, and." Um, well, it's it's not just the process. Yeah. There really there are people sitting there with their with their motivation structures, and and it, it really helped me understand like how yeah. just out of interest. interest this works, yeah. I mean, if anyone else is being through today, how much time of your entire sales cycle is actually get spent in either procurement or let's do procurement and legal together at this point? It's, it's tens of percent, like ten percent, tens, tens, probably tens. multiple no, tens. thirty, okay. thirty percent easily. Anyone else? We're writing security SOPs for a user set right now, and that will take you know, four, six months for a user set. So we're going to yeah. take, security is probably going to take a month out of that. Just Can you get a, a SOC 2 or something that you do once, yeah. get through the hard so day? The, yeah, so you, you, you do, we're, we're going through an audit, and then they have an external audit. We need to get an external auditor also. Um, well, we need to write our own documentation, but when you have one person that handles the data, they don't write themselves documentation to know how to handle the data, they just do it. Yeah. So we need to write that all, that all out now. But it's, it's probably going to be a um, month out of six. You know, maybe six weeks out of six months. How far is that 70%? 70? Yeah. Um, got to mostly in the government. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So one, one interesting thing um, to think about, especially between this, you know, pricing in procurement, right? And just, just that's true for just pricing, it's not true for anything else. But procurement rarely, if ever, has the power to shut you down because of price. They have the power to shut you down because of infosec, because of financial review, because whatever other reason, right? So when someone says, I cannot buy this deal because you're not discounting it or you're not meeting my price tag, that's by and large not true. And they will say that, right? And they will try to find another reason. But if you're convinced that you're clean on any of the other reasons, right, stand firm on price, right? And hang up the phone and they will be back, right? And you can have another conversation. Um, and while it feels uncomfortable, with procurement involved in particular, if you give them their pound of flesh, 10, 20 percent, right, by and large, that's all they need. And I have two experiences to share in that regard. Yes. Um, once we have the backing from the technical side, the only thing procurement can do is probably, I'm not saying this is intentional, right, but it's it's the nature of the work is to slow things down. It's intentional. That's yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's intentional. I want to say, so yeah. that's that. Um, and on the other side, uh, what uh, there was an experience where um, this is a company I was helping with, they got grinded down by the engineering side business side on the price mm -hmm. and you know a lot of conversations finally you know they got to the bottom of it and went to procurement 
procurement got offended because they didn't have any more room. So now, in some sense, I feel like engineering should have backed off a little bit and allowed some room for procurement. Now, if engineering didn't do it, I guess it's on the selling folks to kind of manage that too and synthesize. The simple it. trick on that, and we've seen this, the simple trick on that is that you or your salesperson, as soon as price comes up with the engineering team or the business buyer, you say, I would love to negotiate price with you, but I need your procurement team in the room because I'm not doing it twice, mm -hmm. right? And it, it becomes a very quick conversation, right? What, but what they love doing is exactly that, right? Engineering gets 30%, procurement wants another 30%. Case, procurement was livid that they thought they just walk in and just because of the cloud they'll shave off 20 percent and the company held their ground and they didn't get a renewal. And by the way, what I, what I just said does not mean that you don't talk about price, right? This is, yeah. Here's my list price. This is what we're charging, right? It, and and obviously, if then the negotiation starts. You you need to insist on procurement. Yeah. It also is often a good um, indicator of how, where the deal truly is in your sales process, right? Because if, if someone then says, well, I don't get to procurement until X, Y, Z, you know what needs to happen next week. Um, in your experience, sorry, just to follow up with that one. Um, in your experience, if, if, you know, we've had these conversations a lot where people push you on just naming a price, whatever the price is, just to name something so they know in what kind of ballpark they're talking about. Yeah. Um, I mean, in my, history, like a previous history, we've always kind of gone way over the top just to see what the person's reaction is, you know, just because if we go too low and then, then we don't know what the reaction is, like if we're just too low, they're not going to go like, yes, this is too low. <laughs> yeah. If it's too high, they're going to go like, well, this is way too high. So at least you know where you kind of stand and you can always go down from that point. Is that what you would recommend or do you think? Yeah, I mean, err on the high side, right? Don't be ridiculous, right? There is this, I think someone talked about flinch pricing, right? You say it's $30,000. Per seat, per month, to <laughs> modulate. <laughs> you know, okay, that's where the. Um, so don't go overboard with that. But I think it, it, you do need to bring price up early enough that you're qualifying out. Especially if you sense that there's a huge disconnect, right? If, if someone is thinking 500 bucks a month, but you're thinking 5,000, you need to clear that up early, right? So can okay. you talk about pricing? Sorry, just be quick. I think my instinct would be to be in the room with that person because if you're doing it over a phone, absolutely. You have no I think idea I, I wrote it down here somewhere. <laughs> there, I mean, there's a big difference between list pricing and customized pricing. Right. And by and large, once you get 5K or so and up, you want to do customized pricing, which is I have a list price maybe, but really I'm communicating price to you one on one. I want to be in the room. I want to see how you react. Right. Because okay. that's the incredibly important learning, especially early on. You don't know, if you put 5,000 bucks a month on your website as an enterprise subscription, you don't know how many people look at it, how many people think that's way too expensive, how many people think, wow, that's a great deal. You want to have that conversation in person, right? Eventually, once you have more data, you leave it to your salespeople, you can maybe publish it, but or put it in letters, but any kind of large, you know, customized pricing north of 5K or so, definitely in person. But especially in that space, would you really recommend to put it to, to publish a specific no, price? Not on a on a website. No, there are some um, you know in, in the prior class of the conversation. You know, if you're if you're a subscription business and you're at nineteen you know nineteen ninety five a month and you were at twenty nine, you're sure. fifty, of course. Right. Yeah, if you're Slack, that makes sense. Yeah. But uh, and there you have lots of transaction volume, you have lots of data, right? And you can analyze that data and you can do all sorts of cool experiments on the website. That's a very different pricing model than if you're doing. You know, customized pricing and enterprise deals anywhere on the order of five, ten k or month. Right? Uh, just a quick, quick point. Uh, I just read "Never Split the Difference" a book about negotiation. Um, they suggested when people ask, like, "Oh, you just, it's the first call," but they're just like, "I just need a ballpark." Um, he suggests using like a competitor's price. Uh, so he says, like, you know, Accenture would charge you three hundred thousand dollars for this, but we have some technical advantages or whatever. We'll get to the price later. So that way, he's like. Not said anything about their own price, uh, and also used it as a way to recognize. Yep. Well, at one point we were like trying to hold off with talking about the price until after the pilot, so that we also see how much you know how much value actually we can deliver with the software and sort of get, get to some understanding. And we learned that this really isn't good, and we sort of switched it all around and. Now internally, we have a rule that during the first meeting with the customer, 
they need to see a demo at least for five minutes and they need to hear the noise. And it's just to speed up all the conversations. I fully agree with that. I mean, the whole point, back to the pilot, right? The pilot is really designed to create the business case so that you can get the investment done, right? And if the investment isn't known, you don't have a common set of goals around the business case, right? So you need, that needs to be clear by the front. Um, there's this interesting question around list price sensitivity versus discretion. So if you if you walk in with a million bucks and discounted 90% to $100,000, no, because the customer feels like you're you know you're uh, possibly um, taking advantage of me. That was a silly pricing. Might even feel sleazy, right? Um, do you walk in with a million dollars and go down to 950? That's probably not the right discounting either. So. Part of the exercise, and we do this a lot with our customers, is experimenting around you know, where is the right intersection of uh, presented list price and discount, right? And for enterprise software, it's probably as a first go around 15 to 20 percent, right? 30 to 40 percent is a deep and steep discount if you do multiple deals, if you get some sort of you know free case study with a reference point, etc., uh, uh, you know, referenceability, etc. Agree. Um, that feels about right. A 30-40% discount, you know, with procurement involved, people will be happy in the buying organization. And if you can make that price point work, great. Right. So this implicit kind of, you know, how do you how do you manage the, the list price versus the discretion, whether you present it yourself or whether a salesperson presents it. Does anyone have salespeople yet? I've had some people. <laughs> what happened? I've had other companies. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. definitely want them to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They'll go straight to the bottom to get the information. So let's talk about that principal agent problem, right? Um, pricing and sales comp. So you, maybe you should present this slide. <laughs> um, so it, to the actually, yeah. Once you get to the point where you, you have sales people, right? Probably uh, uh, learning number one is keep it simple, stupid. Right? Because salespeople will spend more time thinking about the comp plan than you ever can. In fact, they spend the entire year thinking about it. Right? So trying to outsmart them in some way, shape, or form usually doesn't work. Keeping it simple right, and making sure that it's very, very clear what you're paying for. You will get exactly what you designed for. If you're paying on billings, you will get billings. If you're paying for logos, you will get logos. If you're paying for you know, some combination of growth margin, referenceability, etc. That's the good news. And so what we've done, for example, is we've said the first three new logos every year will give you a $10,000 kicker, right? If you can get the customer to commit to a press release and a case study in the first 12 months of the deal, we'll give you $10,000, right? So now the salesperson knows very early on that case study and press release is a chip I want to get. Now, we don't need more than three press releases a year, right? Because in, in, in our market, that's what we decided that's what we need. So there's a competition between the sales guys to figure out how do we get the first three customers, right? Um, because they get paid for it and it's bragging rights for them. Right? So that, that works for us. Um, we have, there's this, this, so the pricing problem is an interesting one, right? Because the person who is most price sensitive in the transaction is not your buyer, it's not you, it's the salesperson in the middle, right? And this is amply, documented and lots of research being done, um, it's a principal agent problem, right? Because the salesperson who has a 5 or 10% commission and loses the deal gets 5 or 10% of nothing. The salesperson who discounts by 20% gets 5 or 10% of a 20% lower price tag, which really is only 1% less, right? So in any sales comp structure, by and large, it's very, very hard to counteract that desire, right? And keep them true, you've seen it, right? of the salesperson to go to the to the floor. So one of the things um, that, that we built into our sales plan is we price every deal, right? We do large deals, we custom price every deal. Um, and if you are um, uh, below the target price, and so we set three, we set a target, we set a walk away, and we set a starting point. Right? If you're below the walk away, um, or at the walk away below the target price, your commission gets dropped by 20% automatically. That has a big impact to them, regardless of whether they discount by you know, a couple of points, um, it creates a floor, and they will do everything to stay above that floor. 
So it creates that real kind of discontinuity in their sales compensation to say, you cannot drop the price below wherever, it needs, wherever you know, the, 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 the walkway is established. Does that make sense? Um, Questions so far? I just have a comment because I've been to this so many times. A lot of people do commissions based on gross margin. And salespeople do it. It's really bad because you can play so many games on a margin and you can really screw salespeople over. And most salespeople have been through that before, so they really don't. Yeah. No, I would I would advise against that, right? What you can do is you can say there is a um, there's a price that we establish. Right, and if you're below that price, I'll give you more. Right, um, but once we set the price, generating the margin against that price is really not the salesperson's job. It's you know whether it's services implementation or customer support or ongoing. Right, that's for you to figure out. That's not for the salesperson to worry about. Um, it, I mean, it, it's theoretically good, but it's not in his control or her control. Right, they get really frustrated. Yeah, they get really frustrated. Um, Space around specifically things you want to work really well. Like you pay extra, you pay a dollar amount for case study, that type of stuff. Works really well. um, okay. Sorry, just to clarify, what is the case of these Oh, um, annual contract value, subscription. Oh. If, you're, if you're a SaaS, you know, enterprise SaaS, whatever recurring piece in your subscription. So, the 5 to 10% you mentioned earlier, that's off the top, right? Like as an example, yes, yeah, 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 exactly. So one thing we do, um, this this was, gets a little bit into the value of recurring versus one time, right? We very, very heavily incent the recurring piece in our deals, and we pay for the one time, whether that's you know, in, the, in the case of hardware, it's hardware, whether it's in the case of implementation, implementation, right? So we reward the salesperson uh, for that part of the deal. But the ability to earn incremental commission and retire quota and really make money is all about recurring. If we want the incentive to be to maximize the recurring piece, because ultimately that's what drives valuation, right? Okay, um, so let's talk about the irrational side of pricing, which is kind of fun. So there's this whole notion of price signaling, right? Um, if you don't know what you're buying, price can signal value. Price also signals confidence, right? And I think that's an important one to understand, especially for early stage companies. Right? You walk in, you want to win that first customer, and the customer looks at you and says, I want to know that what, that you have faith in your own solution, that you're confident that you can generate value, right? And doing a free pilot doesn't signal confidence, right? It signals that you're desperate to sign up a customer. Um, so there is that notion of use price to signal the fact that you know that your solution is valuable, you know that it'll work, Right? and you know that the customer should be paying for it. What about that one? Does that make any sense to anyone? Why not? It's the, well, the dollar off the 200K yeah. thing. Uh, everyone, it's Jeez. not the same as 200K, and it, and it really emotionally isn't. It, it, it just, it logically, that makes no sense whatsoever. At enterprise deal size, does it make um, sense to do 199? It's just the same as three easy payments of nine ninety nine or nineteen ninety nine or thirty right. nine ninety nine. Does anyone know why we do nineteen ninety nine or nine ninety five? That's for consumer, right? It's the main yeah. BC track strategy, not for the um, enterprise. They no, I've seen this in enterprise. We've had yeah. salespeople come in and say, "I've offered one ninety nine approval limit." Oh. Do you know why? Do you know why we, we, we charge we charge a dollar ninety nine? Versus two dollars. <laughs> It's a very simple, stupid reason, which is when payments were done in cash, the sellers and retail establishments wanted to ensure that the salesperson, the cashier, opened the register to bring up the sale. So if you sold something for $2, there was a likelihood that the $2 were put in the pocket. If I sold something for $1.99, the register needed to be opened. It rings a bell, the sales manager on the floor knows, you know, Nick just opened the register. So now you need to put the two bucks in, take the penny out, give it to the customer. That's the reason why we price one ninety nine. There's no reason to do that in enterprise sale. There's no reason even to do it today, right? Because no one uses two dollar bills and gives a penny back. Um, so this notion of price, you know, that is one ninety nine or two hundred thousand, actually works against you. One ninety nine works against you because it's silly. 
right? Um, 200,000 also works against you because it doesn't seem like you actually have a logic behind it. You just picked a number. So go with 205, right? Or 211, 500, right? That seems like there must be a formula. They clearly thought about it, right? Um, I kid you not, that it's as simple as that. Um, and by it's not doing, rational, but it's true. Are, are you saying by doing that, that increases the likelihood of, of someone going with you? Not necessarily going with you. It increases the credibility of the price. Right. 211500 signals that there is a logic and a rationale to that price. Right. 199 signals, 199 doesn't signal anything. Signals that you, you, you thought you want to get 200, but then you read something about you know, putting a one in front makes it easier. So at that dollar value, that doesn't work, right? So for us, we're doing meeting rooms per hour, and we're thinking we do like a round number, it's easier for them to just think, okay, yeah. this is how much we're going to pay versus, say, $47. And so I have a good one for you. Okay. Um, it's coming up. <laughs> but 50 bucks is fine, right? I think we're 30 or 80. Um, I think there's positioning you can do that's interesting. Um, so there's price framing, right? And I think uh, you mentioned it, right? This notion of how do I put free prices in front of you? Now, this is less around customized pricing with more around list pricing. You can do it in customized pricing as well, but how do I present the price that I wanna charge, right? By having a high price decoy, right? To uh, make this one seem less expensive. And you can do the same thing with you know, value on the, in the proposal, right? Just anchoring the price, framing the price, relative to a large number makes the price itself seem smaller. There's a couple of interesting tricks. There's a whole notion of risk aversion, loss aversion that you can trigger in consumers. Um, and to some extent, in small deals and, and small enterprises, it works as well. Um, and then there's this notion of numeric nudges, so we'll go through each of them. It's kind of With risk aversion, you mean like a, like a FOMO situation, where they're just like, they're basically worried that if they don't go with you, they're gonna miss out on something critical? Or? Yeah. So this, this is a classic example of loss aversion, right? This is consumer, American banker, it's actually sold into enterprises, right? This subscription is um, $1,500 a year. Um, and what they're doing on their website is, in bright red, they say, register for a free week, or I decline my free week. It's a very subtle but clever positioning, right? I'm declining a free week. How stupid is that, right? I'm declining a free week, I'm taking, um, register for a free week, right? It, I, it, not doing it feels like a loss rather than I'm signing up for something, right? It's a, just a subtle framing around you're losing out. It's the phone, right? Um, if you think about this in terms of pricing, there is this loss aversion that um, this is the, uh, the FT uses very, very well. You have the annual option, which is four seventy nine a week, or you have the monthly option at $27. That makes sense. So what they're doing, right, is the large annual fee gets reframed as the smaller weekly fee. Rather than saying, you know, 249 in bold, which is really what you're paying. That is what you're paying. Once you click that, that's what they're gonna charge you. They're not saying, you know, you need to pay 249. I'm looking at this going, 479, well, if I don't like it, that, that's not that big of a loss, right? 250, that's a big loss. If I don't read it, you know, eight months from now. There's a very subtle position in here where you say the monthly is 27, uh, the annual is only 479 a week. Right? So Nick, in your business, that might be an interesting one, right? Because you have to play, you can play with uh, probably different levels of office quality, mm -hmm. length of commitment, right? And maybe even prepayment versus you know, when you invoice, et cetera. And so there is this option to to subtly position different commitment levels um, and use this notion that as humans, we're actually not very good at, at math, right? Mm. Um, and this kind of, this is the economy on level, <coughs> level two, right? Gut instinct taking over versus this rational. Now, rationally, I would do some sort of uh, time value of money calculation and figure out what my cost of capital is and then say, no, this deal doesn't make sense to me. But irrationally, I look at this and go, 479 doesn't seem like a bad deal. Yeah, but it's per week, right? So the other one's monthly, so you actually only saving two dollars a month. Of course, but, but you're a rational person. Right, but right? the point is, an enterprise people don't do that. 
I feel like an enterprise that people do catch on, they feel like, you know, you just you're just trying, yeah, like, it's just like, you think I'm an idiot. <laughs> that has to be done very slowly because there's things where it says, like, click this button if you don't care about productivity. Yeah. So just went through the whole It's called Mixmax, by the way. Yeah. It's, a, it's a Calendly kit ripoff, and I am never going to use it again because yeah, I hate it when people say things like, if you don't care about productivity, you're yeah. stupid, click this, click this button, and I think, F you mix facts. But you we call this we call this banker bias. So we sell to bankers. Right, right. And, and bankers are these rational people who say, oh that's never a problem. Well if you take if you use this loan option versus that loan option, right? This yeah. one is clearly more expensive. Like, no guys, consumers don't think that way. Yeah. It, consumers have a hard time forecasting time, right? Four weeks, a month, fifty two weeks in a year, etc. That is 50% of people who look at this do not think about the, the long term, right, and how much more they could save or not save, right? So the time dimension is, a, is an interesting one, right? And yeah. at the margin, you can use it. I mean, there will be people who are rational and who think this is silly and I'm being paid. I did, this, I did this with LinkedIn today. I bought LinkedIn Sales Navigator today. Yeah. I didn't buy the end of it. You didn't buy the end of it? I didn't buy it. Okay. But I think you're the exception. <laughs> Just this, this works, right? I mean, it, it does. Yeah. I was going to ask that. Actually, um, I find myself, my rational side has to actually convince myself that it was ir irrational to think the first time was a good deal. So then you have, have more mm -hmm. effort. You're like trying to like re-convince yeah. yourself. So that effort, a lot of people don't go over that effort, and then they would push it. Yeah. yeah. But the low effort, right, and this is, again, the human evolution is we're going to go with what's easy and straightforward. The low effort way in this scenario is you go to the 479. Okay. So lower number. But what if it were six? And it's still much smaller than 27, right? Yeah, so you get to you actually get to a different point, which is the decoy. Right. Mm -hmm. right. Uh, so this is an interesting one. JSTOR is scientific journal, so it's subscription. So this is this is fantastic. Because you look at this and say, I want a paper, right? I'm like I'm reading this paper, I need to download it, I want the PDF. You can sign up and you can pay ten bucks to download it. Or you can get a subscription for nine ninety nine. Well, subscription makes sense, right? So what they're gambling on is that once you subscribe, you will not cancel. Right? Yeah. It's a monthly subscription. It's nine ninety five, nine ninety nine. But the immediate reaction is the ten bucks seems expensive. It makes the nine ninety five a month really really cheap, right? Am I going to download more than one paper per month? Any anything I download, unless it's you know, unless I don't do anything, this is always a better deal. So um, you can use that as you know, as, as the, the decoy duck, right? To say this is really what I want you to focus on. Um, and then you can combine these, right? To say reference points and, and nudges. So this is another interesting one. Uh, this is the New York Times. So they're doing two things, right? They're one comparing. Uh, the price to a higher number. So right now the price is eight dollars a month versus sixteen dollars. So it's reduced, but they're also using this fear of missing out FOMO thing of it's a limited time offer only for a certain period. Right. So I have two things that work here. Uh, the time sale won't last. Subscribe today, cancel any time. It's a really good deal. I got to jump on. All these effects are you know, are real, and one of the ways in which you can figure that out is. Um, is through testing, right? So this is another great example of, you know, you, you iterate on different positioning. Again, it's list-based pricing, not, not customized pricing, right? This is the same exact product offering, and these are acceptance rates. Um, this is a bank example, right? Where up here you see, get your pre-approved loan of 5,900 pounds, you know, 120 pounds a month, uh, repayment paid in 60 months, you know, dedicated fixed interest rate of 8%. Same exact terms on the next one over. The only thing difference is there's a couple of logos underneath that say, guess what? You could take a plane trip somewhere. You could, you know, buy a car. You could go to a couple of theater performances. And then the next one actually takes the same exact thing and puts pictures behind it, pictures of a doctor saying health. You could, you know, studies, renewals, etc. And then here is this, you know, picture with an idea of a flight to Cancun, two people in business class, five star hotel. Eating in restaurants, entertainment, souvenirs, fifty-nine hundred pounds. That one gets a fifty-six percent acceptance rate. Isn't that fascinating? The same exact product, same exact price. All they're doing is experimenting with, you know, putting ideas in people's heads. So, 
the point of this is that there are these irrational sides to pricing, right? They're less prevalent in enterprise. And they're less prevalent the further, you know, the higher the deal, but these effects are real. We've I mean, we've done things where we say, here's our list price, this is our price for this for you as your institution, uh, right? That's lowered a little bit, and then you still have a negotiation, right? There's another, so then obviously your list price needs to be high enough to start with, that even after the 20% discount for the value of the artist customer relationship, and your 15% you know, squeeze from procurement, you get to the price that you originally wanted to get to. Yeah, the valued customer um, thing works, right? I mean, obviously the logic is you buy more, you, you commit for longer, right? We will lower the price. There's one of one of the top sales guys in my old company. They um, he had it was a funny trick. I, it only really worked towards kind of the last month of the quarter, but he would basically consistently tell everybody that he was on target and that he didn't really care about like whether he makes like whether he actually has to hit a quota or not, and would say like. Yeah, but I can only do that till the end of the quarter because afterwards, then you know, my, my target resets. Yeah, and then he would go through that one, but he was more of like a personal sales guy, like he championed the people properly with like an actual personal kind of relationship. So, you're bringing up an interesting point, which is that um, um, most sales and procurement cycles, right, are very much driven by, by public company quarterly earnings, right? So Procurement uh, teams and lawyers do not get vacation you know, in December because they know they have to do a bunch of deals for large enterprise buyers, right? And there's lots of public companies who are selling who are incented to get deals done or, you know, comp plans that are designed to reward you if you hit your quota and you get a kicker, etc. You bring the deal in by December 30th. So when someone buys a million dollar or a half a million dollar subscription, Internally, they will budget for overruns. They will budget for incremental services, for incremental costs, right? And it's just, it's A, part of standard corporate budgeting and planning and governance. Um, but if you know that, you can go after it, right? And that could be you know, change requests. If you're doing custom work, it could be charging more for time and materials, right? If you're doing, invariably, in early stage pilots, you're doing a bunch of work for free anyway. So go back and try to find some of that 20% that's sitting somewhere in that budget, right? Um, because it is by and large. Could you explain that? Because the expansion, uh, expansion um, budget is for a later down. So what do you mean is like plan in the timeline of the pilot to charge more? Yeah, and, and, it, and it may not be there on day one, right? But it will be there you know, three months, six months, nine months in, right? And a lot of times, if you don't know that, right, um, you, you're not going to ask for it. My point is, there is usually large corporations when they buy software, right, when they buy technical services, when they buy consulting, right, they will budget for more than what they're paying you because they anticipate overruns and incremental costs, right, whether from their own internal IT people or whether from you. Right? So if you don't ask for it, you can't capture it. But just go back and, and try to find it, right? try to find that budget. Does that make sense? So, in some sense, uh, if you're trying to sell something that forces them to go for a whole procurement cycle, that is three months, versus they already have 20% and it's two weeks for them because they've already budgeted it. If, it so, that's yeah. yours. My point, point is, if you, if you walk in and you say, my solution is $300,000 a year and $100,000 to implement, you're asking for $400,000 commitment. A savvy and most corporate buyers will go to procurement and their budget and say it's you know four hundred thousand dollars for you know fusion memory, but I need five or six hundred thousand because I want to hire a contractor. I you know want to ensure myself. I don't want that project to fail, and I certainly don't want to go back to the budgeting cycle and process. Right, and so that money is sitting there somewhere, right? And you might as well capture it. And there's another side to that, which is if they don't spend that that goes back next year, they don't get what they asked for. So if you don't use it, they'll find other ways to spend it anyway before mm -hmm. it gets passed. So That's the other interesting thing. There's, yeah. <laughs> you find these you know, $100,000 here and there that are sitting around right by the end of the year, and bizarrely, unless someone has zero-based budgeting, people want to spend it right? because they don't get their budget the next year. Mm -hmm. So that's the other one that you can vacuum up if you go back and say, whether it's incremental seats or you know expansion, incremental scope, whatever. Right. So that's, that's, right. that's not proposed in the initial pilot no. phase, but then you say, hey, do you guys, you know, in the fiscal year, we have all these other additional things which you like to yeah. also consider them. Yeah. 
Yeah, you can do it. You can do it uh, along the way. You can actually set it up if you, even in the initial proposal and the initial deal, say, "Here's our roadmap. Right? These are the incremental features that we're working on. Here is, you know, potentially other, whether it's other businesses, other, you know, extending the number of seats, whatever the, you know, the expansion metric is. You can set it up, and that will signal to the buyer, okay, I should probably reserve some money for that. Right. Right. Additional topics." This clearly makes a lot of sense for B2B, but for B2Cs, um, should we care more about utilization and, and uh, more people using it versus optimizing margins at this point? I mean, if you, if you can do both, do both, right? The point here is that money is out there, you might as well capture it. I think you're right that for B2C, that, that's not a consumer's thing, right? Um, and honestly, I'm not a B2C pricing expert. So I think you're probably better off with leverage around the some of the, the kind of somewhat silly behavioral pricing, you know, positioning, framing, leveraging biases, etc. Leveraging the fact that consumers don't really know how to think about time and predict the future. Right? In that type of subscription model that you're running. Okay. What do you mean by your sales team is more price sensitive than your customer? So, like, it's this it's the principal agent problem, right? Um, your sales team is, especially once they get to price negotiation and procurement, they're calculating how much that deal is worth to them in commissions. Mm -hmm. And let's say it's $20,000 or $30,000 or whatever it is, right? Or even $5,000. Losing the deal means zero, mm -hmm. right? Lowering the price on that deal by 10%, 20% lowers their commission by an equivalent amount, right? Unless you work the system or you know, design the compliment to work against that. So by and large, they will lower the price, lower the price, lower the price, more so than the customer needs. Right? That's the point. Right? Um, so holding the line against your salesperson, right? and my salespeople know that. They come in and they ask for something and they never get it. They get something, but they never get the price discount they really want. Right? And by and large, it works. It's very, very rarely that a customer truly then says, no, I can't buy. So I just wanted to get back to that budgetary um, conversation. We had something that, that's been working all right with, for us is not necessarily asking how much, because nobody will ever tell you how much budget they have, right. but to actually ask what their budgetary period is. And that's something that people usually do share. Like they could just say, you know, it's either ends in Q4 or we have actually quarterly budgets, or I mean, generally they don't, but of course, usually yeah. yearly budgets. But that will then give you an indication in what time, because that's pretty, I mean, timeline sensitive, right? So like, if you want to push for like a, you know they have budgets still available and you want to go for that kind of sales play, then you need to do that in Q3, Q4. It's not going to work in Q1 when they still have all their budget, of course. Uh, it, I think I found it rare. For people to tell you what their budget is, you have to have a really strong relationship. Right. You have to have been there for a while. I, existing customers will do that, right? Yeah. And we have customers who we've worked with for years and years, and they will come in at the beginning of the year. And they even ask, how much should we budget for you next year? Great. Yeah. <laughs> whatever you had last year, plus 30%. <laughs> yeah. So you can give them, that, and that's great if you know that. The question you can ask, um, even a new buyer, right, is what's your approval authority? Or help me understand, right, if we're at a million dollars, where does that need to go in the organization, right? Who has the budget approval in it, right? That's a slightly easier question to ask, right? Um, and if you don't get an answer to that, you know you're in trouble, right? Because you want to know who you're talking to, right? If the person you're talking to cannot swing more than a $10,000 commitment and you're talking about a deal like the size you're selling, Okay, um, and then the last point is, um, you know, you will never get it right. Um, pricing is, you know, fascinating because there's so much to learn and you're always slightly wrong. So a big part of it is just keep iterating, right? Keep trying things, keep testing things, right? We still iterate pricing metrics, you know, what we use as the driver, positioning, Right, discount levels, um, and we never stop learning. So it's not like, you know, I've figured out pricing, now let me focus on the rest of the business. Pricing is an ongoing exercise, an ongoing challenge. And the good news about it is, again, back to the 10%, right? The, the last 10% of price that you get is pure profit. It's pure margin, right? It extends your runway, pays your bonus, pays another you know, engineer, whatever you have. So from that perspective, it's a very powerful level you have. Do you have any tips on how to find out the competition's pricing? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Again, the one of the things in, in enterprise selling that, that 
that I found works is you don't really get it from your buyer, right? A lot of times, especially if there's an RFP or some competitive scenario where they're talking to you and two of your competitors, but you can get it from other people. Right? Sometimes you can get it through, if you have an internal coach um, who helps you, sometimes you can get it through finance people. Um, if you have really good relationships, you can't, they will tell you, right? Here's where your competitors are, but it rarely, rarely happens. So if it's, custom, if it's you know, true enterprise sales, behind the scenes, customized pricing, um, then it's hard to find out. You know, we, we've done things like, we walk in and we say, we know we're 30% of our nearest competitor, and that's where we want to be. And you watch the response, right? You see, is that true? Are we potentially higher than that? Are we potentially lower than that? But there's no, no exact science to that. I'd like to ask, so, uh, how much should we charge for a pilot? Uh, per, for a pilot. And like, in some way you were saying charge the first two months of your typical uh, contract. Uh, I would like to understand, like, if there is, especially in the US, if there's like, just, just typical values for a pilot. I don't think there are. I mean, 90 day opt out. 90 day opt out. Yeah, I mean, what, sorry, so, remind me again what your what do you think your pricing models are? Well, we're selling analytics, and yeah. so so we're really charging different companies for different uh, different money. Yeah. And we find that in Europe, um, there are certain like typical uh, values, you know, for for a pilot, and we just learn to to price it at those price points. Because people are more or less used to paying that much, yeah, for a pilot. I mean, I, I guess at a high level, you know, the standard price point for a pilot is probably less than 100k. That seems to be a pretty common budgetary cutoff, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. You're doing something for six months for five people, uh, this number of users, or you know, some platform, mm -hmm. or some integration. You know, 50k, 100k. Once you get much below 25k, the, you run into the problem that people don't really care, right? So. And that's a very unscientific no, that's an answer. That's you know, exactly talk to answer. you more about it. Yeah. And the other thing is to think about pilot in relation to the where you want to be from a subscription full subscription perspective, right? Um, because the pilot price also signals yeah. where where you think you need to be, right? Yeah. Um, cool. Other questions? If not, thank you guys for your attention. Always fun.